Hello everyone, today we are going to talk about trigonometry. To get started we'll have a look at triangles and more specifically their naming conventions. This is a triangle. We name its corners using uppercase letters, for example A, B and C. The angles are written using the corresponding Greek letter, so for corner A that is alpha, for B, that's beta, and for C, that's gamma. The sides opposite to a corner are written with the corresponding lowercase letter, so for point A, that's A, and then B and C for points B and C. The sum of the angles of a triangle is always equal to 180 degrees. For the majority of this video, we won't discuss generic triangles like this one, instead we'll cover right-angled triangles. In that case, we don't have to name the angle gamma, but we just use the right-angled symbol. We don't care too much about the corners of the triangle either, so we don't have to name them. When we are talking about one of the angles of the triangle, for example angle alpha, then C is the hypotenuse, B is the adjacent side, and A is the opposite side. However, if we're talking about angle beta, then A is the adjacent side and B is the opposite side. With that knowledge, we're now ready to move on to trigonometric functions. We also call them goniometric functions. The first three ones we'll have a look at are the sine, cosine and tangent. The sine of an angle is defined as the length of the opposite side divided by the length of the hypotenuse. The cosine is defined as the adjacent side over the hypotenuse and the tangent as the opposite side over the adjacent side. There are two ways in which you can calculate the sine of an angle. Either you know the lengths of the triangle sides and then you can just divide the length of the opposite side by the length of the hypotenuse, or you know the angle and then you can take a calculator which will return the ratio of the opposite side and the hypotenuse. Of course, the same is true for the cosine and tangent. If you can't remember these formulas, then all you need to know is so ka toa. If we now take our triangle and assign some imaginary lengths to its sides, then we can fill in these lengths in our formulas, and then we can calculate that the sine of theta is equal to 0 0.6, the cosine of theta is equal to 0 0.5 and the tangent of theta is equal to 0 0.75. To understand why this calculation is useful, we'll have a look at the inverse trigonometric functions, also referred to as the cyclometric functions. So what are those inverse trigonometric functions? Well, it is the arc sine, the arc cosine and the arc tangent. These three functions return the angle of a triangle based on the ratio of the lengths of two sides of that triangle. You might recognize that opposite over hypotenuse, adjacent over hypotenuse and opposite over adjacent are the exact same formulas which we use to calculate the sine, cosine and tangent. So we could say that the arc sine of the sine of an angle is the angle itself. And the same goes for the cosine and tangent. Let's once again take our triangle, fill in the lengths of its sides in our formula, and now we have to take a calculator to calculate the arc sine of 6 divided by 10, the arc cosine of 8 divided by 10, and the arc tangent of 6 divided by 8. There is a way to approximate these values by hand, but more on that later. Calculating the arc sine with a calculator would give a result of 36.87 degrees. Now it should come as no surprise that the arc cosine and arc tangent return the exact same angle since all of these formulas calculate the same angle, theta in this case. There's even more trigonometric functions and I like to think of them as advanced trigonometric functions, however they're not really that special. I'm talking about the cosecant, the secant and the cotangent. You might notice that these are very similar to the sine, cosine and tangent. In fact, all that's different to them is that the nominator and denominator of these fractions have swapped places. That is why the cosecant is equal to 1 over the sine, the secant is equal to 1 over the cosine and the cotangent is equal to 1 over the tangent. We won't have an in-depth look at these three functions, but I will say that they also have an inverse, which is the arc cosecant, the arc secant and the arc cotangent. Just as the sine, cosine and tangent 
The arc cosecant of the cosecant of an angle is equal to the angle itself, and of course the same is true for the secant and cotangent. Before we move on, I thought we'd have a quick overview of all the functions we just saw. Given this triangle, I've made a list of how to calculate the sine, cosine, tangent, cosecant, secant and cotangent of both angle alpha and angle beta. Of course, you don't have to remember all of this by heart, all you need to know is so ka toa, and then you can just derive these formulas. We also saw that there were arc functions, so we can rewrite these formulas to calculate those. And now you can see that we've got six expressions to calculate the angle alpha, and six expressions to calculate the angle beta. To calculate one of those angles, you can pick whichever expression you like, as long as you know the side lengths that are required to calculate its result. Finally, we can rearrange all these formulas once again to come up with four expressions to calculate the length of each side of the triangle. These formulas are just derived from the trigonometric functions definitions we saw earlier. To get a better understanding of what all of this means, I want to introduce to you the unit circle. For that, I will need a coordinate system on which I'll draw a circle. I'm also gonna simplify the coordinate system a bit, since it's actually gonna get in our way. The unit circle is nothing more than a circle that is centered at the origin and has a radius of 1. It cuts the x-axis at x equals negative 1 and x equals 1, and it cuts the y-axis at y equals negative 1 and y equals 1. We can also assign some angles, starting at 0 degrees and increasing counterclockwise to 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 270 degrees, and then a full circle contains 360 degrees. If we move clockwise, we get a negative angle, in this case an angle of negative 45 degrees, and if we move counterclockwise, we get positive angles, in this case an angle of 45 degrees. I'm now gonna draw a triangle under this blue line, and by now if I show a triangle, you should think immediately of our trigonometric functions. So how do these apply to our triangle? Well, of course, the radius of our circle, or in other words, the blue side, is the hypotenuse, the base of our triangle is the adjacent side, and the height of our triangle is the opposite side. However, it is kind of incorrect to think of the adjacent and opposite sides as being the length of the base and the length of the height of our triangle, because if you think of it like that, then depending on the angle, our triangle will have a negative width or height, and that is of course not possible. So a better way to think of this is to think of the adjacent and opposite sides as being the coordinate of the point where our blue line intersects with the circle. To visualize that, we can rearrange our drawing and rearrange our formulas for the sine, cosine and tangent. The sine of theta is equal to y over r, and the cosine of theta is equal to x over r. However, since r is 1 in this case, we can say that the x-coordinate of our point is equal to the cosine of theta, and the y-coordinate of our point is equal to the sine of theta. To determine the value for the tangent of theta, we could individually read the y and x-coordinate, and then divide them by each other, or we could also immediately read that on a third axis, which we call the tangent axis. We read that value by extending our blue line, and then the point where it intersects with the tangent axis is going to be the value for the tangent of theta. To take this one step further, we can make a graph that contains the values for the sine, cosine and tangent for every possible angle. To do that, let's take a graph, and first of all I'm going to plot the values for the sine. As you can see, it has a range from negative 1 to 1, over the course of 360 degrees. Let's do the same thing for the cosine, which also has a range from negative 1 to 1. You might have noticed that the cosine has a similar graph to the sine. In fact, it is exactly the same, just offset it by 90 degrees. Therefore, we can say that the cosine of theta is equal to the sine of 90 degrees minus theta. Similarly, we can say that the sine of theta is equal to the cosine of 90 degrees minus theta. 
The last function we'll plot is the tangent function, which has a range from negative infinity to positive infinity. An alternative way to calculate the tangent of theta is to say that it is equal to the sine of theta divided by the cosine of theta. Let's now have an in-depth look at one of these functions, and I'm going to take the sine function. Given an angle, in this case one of 45 degrees, we can use this graph to calculate the sine of that angle. To do that, we look up the angle on the x-axis of our graph, we trace a line up to the sine function, and then a line to the y-axis, and that gives us a value of 0.71 for the sine of theta. Alternatively, given that the sine of theta is equal to 0.71, we could calculate the arc sine by doing the opposite. We just trace a line to our sine function. But wait, we can also trace a second line to our sine function, which has the same value. So therefore, the arc sine of 0.71 has two possible angles. 45 degrees and 135 degrees. How is that possible? Well, to explain that I'll also draw the 135 degree angle. Now as you know, we read the sine value for a given angle on the y-axis, so if we do that for the 45 degree angle, it looks like this. And if we do it for the 135 degree angle, you'll see that we get the exact same y value and therefore the same sine. The arc sine function will always return just one of these possible values, and that will be an angle between negative 90 and 90 degrees that corresponds to the given sine. In this case, the returned angle is 45 degrees. However, there is a relationship between these two angles which allows us to calculate the second possible outcome. That relationship is that these angles are each other's supplement, meaning that their sum is equal to 180 degrees. We can therefore say that the sine of theta is equal to the sine of 180 degrees minus theta. The cosine function has a similar property, saying that the cosine of theta is equal to the cosine of negative theta, and the tangent function also has a similar property, saying that the tangent of theta is equal to the tangent of 180 degrees plus theta. You can derive this information from the unit circle or the graphs of the corresponding functions. To elaborate a bit more on this, I want to have a look at vectors and how we can use trigonometric functions together with them. So let's say that we have an angle of 225 degrees. We read the cosine of theta on the x-axis over here, and we read the sine of theta on the y-axis over here. Now what if we want to construct a direction vector at a 225 degree angle? Well, you can see here that the x component of that vector would be equal to the cosine of theta, and the y component of that vector would be equal to the sine of theta. So we can write the components of that vector as the cosine of theta and the sine of theta. If we don't want a unit vector, we can just multiply the x and y components with the desired length of our vector. Now the question is, can we also do the opposite? Given a direction vector, can we calculate the angle? As we saw earlier, given that we know the x and y components, we can use the arc tangent to calculate the angle theta. In this case, y divided by x is equal to 1, so we need to calculate the arc tangent of 1. However, we also just saw that the arc functions only return one of the two possible solutions. In fact, the arc tangent of 1 would return this vector at a 45 degree angle, which is of course not the correct one. That is why some calculators and programming languages provide an additional function called atan2, which takes in the x and y components separately and can use that information to calculate the correct vector. To understand why, we'll have a look at the graph of the tan function. We know that the angle that we want to calculate has a tangent of 1. If we trace a line, we have two points at which it intersects with our tangent graph, and therefore we can also see that we have two possible angles being 45 degrees and 225 degrees. We now need an extra piece of information to determine which angle is the correct one. We know that for angles between 0 and 90 degrees, x is positive and y is positive. For angles between 90 and 180 degrees, the x component is negative and the y component is positive. 
For angles between 180 and 270 degrees, the x and y components are negative, and for angles between 270 and 360 degrees, the x component is positive and the y component is negative. Since we pass the x and y component separately to our a tan 2 function, it can use that information to narrow its surge down and therefore return the correct angle, in this case that was of course 225 degrees. Talking about angles, there is an alternative way in which we can represent them, and that is using radians. To understand what a radian is, I'm going to take a circle, and the red line I draw here is the radius of that circle. If we now move that line next to the circle, and warp it on the circumference of that circle, without modifying its original length, then the angle that is formed by that arc is what we call one radian. Then this is of course two radians, this is three radians, and a semicircle, or 180 degrees, is equal to pi radians. So a full circle, or 360 degrees, is then two pi radians. In other words, two pi is the amount of times the radius of a circle fits in its circumference. We can now use this information to rewrite our angles from degrees into radians. Zero degrees is of course zero radians, 90 degrees is pi over 2 radians, 180 degrees is pi radians, and 270 degrees is 3 pi over 2 radians. How do we convert from radians to degrees and the other way around? Well, we know that pi radians is equal to 180 degrees. So to convert from degrees to radians, we just multiply with pi over 180. And to convert from radians to degrees, we multiply by 180 over pi. All the trigonometric functions we discussed so far only apply in right angle triangles. However, there is a way to use them in non right angle triangles, and that is using the cosine rule, also referred to as the law of cosines. It is defined as this formula. This formula is based around the angle gamma, but there also exist variants for the angle beta or alpha we'll have a look at this variant. So if we take this non-right angle triangle, we can use this formula, which of course also works in right angle triangles, to calculate either the angle of one of the corners or the length of one of the sides of the triangle. To do that, we have to reformulate that formula like so, and this gives us an expression for the length of side A, or we can reformulate the formula once again, and this gives us an expression for the angle of alpha. To understand where the cosine rule comes from, I'm gonna draw a line H, and this line divides our triangle in two right angle triangles. B was of course the width of our original triangle, and I'm also gonna introduce D, which is the width of the left triangle. The width of the right triangle is of course equal to B minus D. Since we now have two right angle triangles, we can write down the Pythagoras theorem twice once for the left triangle and once for the right triangle. If we rearrange these formulas, we can write them such that we've got two expressions that calculate h squared, and therefore the results of these formulas are also equal to each other. Using some math magic, we can rewrite that formula and make it a bit easier. We know that d divided by c is equal to the cosine of alpha, we can rewrite that to say that d is equal to c times the cosine of alpha. And now all that's left to do is to fill in the bottom formula in the top formula, and now we have the expression for our cosine rule. If you paid close attention, you might have noticed that the cosine rule is a generic formulation of the Pythagoras theorem. As you know, the Pythagoras theorem only works in right angle triangles. So if this triangle had a 90 degree angle, then alpha would be 90 degrees, and the cosine of 90 degrees is equal to zero, which means that our entire formula simplifies to the Pythagoras theorem we're all familiar with. All right, that was everything I wanted to cover in this video. I hope you learned something. If you enjoyed this series, then please consider becoming a patron on patreon.com forward slash floatymonkey. With that being said, I'll see you all next time. Goodbye.